Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be the child of a major Hollywood icon? Well, you're about to find out. Our guest is the son of one of the film industry's most respected and legendary studio executives, Jennings Lang. Known for blockbusters like The Sting, Jaws, Slaughterhouse-Five, Play Misty for Me, Earthquake, and all those airport movies. He's a film director, screenwriter, producer, and best-selling author of eight books, including Growing Up Hollywood, Tales from the Son of a Hollywood Mogul. He's the one and only Rocky Lang. Rocky, thank you so much for coming back to our show. Thank you. I love your I love your show. I I, I love your guests. It's a it's a breath of fresh air out there for all of us who care about writing and movies and interesting uh, people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rocky, for those lovely comments. For those of you who are wondering why Rocky looks so familiar, it's because he recently appeared on our show to discuss his wonderful book, Letters from Hollywood, and I hope you all watch that interview. But today, it's all about Rocky's own life, and I have to ask you, Rocky, even by Hollywood standards, wouldn't you agree that your life was very unconventional? I think my life was unconventional. The only thing I can say about that is because both of my parents were depression kids who came from nothing, they were insistent on me being grounded. And so as big a life as we had, believe me, that they made me realize that I was fortunate and they made me realize like who they were, that to respect people for who they were and to sort of be as modest as you can. And sometimes in Hollywood, that's hard, but growing up in the depression is a whole different ball game. And our, my generation and my children's generation, they just have no idea what it's like not to know where your food is coming from or where there's going to be a house over your head. So that was my parents' background. But yes, unconventional, absolutely. I want to start by talking about your father, Jennings Lang. He was a remarkable man. He was the youngest person ever to pass the bar in New York. Then he became an agent for some of the biggest Hollywood stars, including Humphrey Bogart, Joan Crawford, Lauren Bacall, Richard Burton, and many others. He eventually became vice president of MCA, where he oversaw the production of many hit TV shows and blockbuster movies for Universal Studios. I can tell from your book that you had enormous affection and respect for your dad, didn't you? I did. He was my best friend. I was very fortunate uh, to have that relationship with him and my mom. But it's interesting, like when you're little, you know, you sort of gravitate to your mom. But so I started to figure out who my dad was a little bit older and I wanted to get in the movie business from probably the time I was, you know, 13 or 14 until he died. You know, we shared everything together. We had a lot in common outside of the movie business. We both were loved sports, which obviously I got from him and art and music. And there's a, there's a lot of stuff that my dad and I shared together. And he was a really a bigger than life a person cast a big shadow. And for some reason, I avoided him you know, yelling at me very much because he was a big yeller. He's a powerful guy. And I sort of like uh, snuck by on that one. How did he manage to have such longevity in an industry that's notorious for constant turnover with studio executives? Well, I think my dad was an incredible um, innovator and uh, able to sort of remake himself in how things were changing. And, and what you had said, I mean, you know, going from, from agent to, you know, executive to producer, there's a lot of hats going on there. He also was you know, married to MCA for so many years. He was, you know, 35 years plus with that company. And he was one of the only men at the time. I mean, there were a couple others, but he was one of the only people who could green light his own movies because he walked this line between being an MCA senior VP and also being a producer. And I mean, it didn't mean he could like, you know, green light a huge movie, but he had a lot of flexibility in the types of movies that he made. He was not accredited with the jaw with Jaws or the Sting, but he was very involved in acquiring those properties for the studio. So when Zanuck and Brown came to the studios, part of that deal was to provide them with those packages. And uh, you know, David and Dick did a great job with Jaws and Sting. I mean, there's there's no taking any credit from them. They were great. But my dad was not, my dad was out producing Earthquake and the airport movies at that time. Well, he was an incredibly gifted multitasker. He worked on numerous big projects simultaneously, and he was intuitive about the people he trusted and the projects he supported. Are studio executives a different breed today? I think so. I mean, I think everything shifted so much in the industry as things do. I mean, it's, it's shifted a few times. I mean, you can go back to 
the studio system of the you know forties and fifties, and then see the transitions of what had happened there. The seventies was a big shift of power going to directors with Scorsese and Coppola and Paul Schrader and that whole group of uh, you know really innovators were so they shifted there and then when the multinational corporations started to take over the studios and they became bottom lines then those executives had a answer to another boss and so I don't know that the, the creatives today executives today are that geared towards the creative idea because we're living in a time where intellectual property or what they're what branding is what's dictating production. So, you know, the writer who sits in his rooms and comes up with something out of nothing has a very hard time of getting that project to the screen because they're doing Batman 14. And, and that's really difficult. And so that, that creative executive right now is also having to cover their ass and legitimize the choices of the movies that they, they pick because they don't want someone to say to them, hey, you know, why did you do this? And he can say then, Hey, well, why not? You know, made you know a hundred million dollars in the seven movies that went before it, and so the, the whereas my father in that generation, even you know people who worked with him or alongside him with the mid tannins of the world, you know they were guys who took chances on on young filmmakers with with new ideas, and so that was that's a big shift. And, and just to go back a second to when you were talking about my dad's longevity, is that he always felt that the movie business was going to make a shift and we're seeing that today that people had to have a reason to go to the theaters and they had to be event movies and so the first term ever called event was on earthquake a movie event and now you see events on everything and so sense around was born out of that idea the idea of like going to a theater seeing feeling the earthquake and having the whole theater shake behind blow you was a bigger experience than going and watching it just as, as a movie. And so he was constantly looking for ways to create event-oriented films because he believed as prices went up and as people started to gravitate more to television, that it would be harder to get people into the movie. So in, in some ways, as innovative as my father was, he was already thinking what we're seeing today with big budgeted, big action movies in those times. Now, dad also balanced it those movies with really smart and great, great films like Slaughterhouse Five, and uh, as you, as you know, Play Misty for me would start as a very small movie, and he, you know he did some a little tiny film called Nunzio out of New York. So he balanced these big movies with um, these movies he cared about or that had a message in them. I think it's only fair to point out that your mother was also famous. She was Monica Lewis, a well-known jazz singer and film actress, and she was the voice of Chiquita Banana. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah, that's funny. It's funny that, you know, when, when mom passed, that you know, all the headlines of all the papers associated her with Chiquita Banana, and she, and she had so much more in her life than Chiquita Banana, but we loved it. I actually found... Um, in a box, the original scripts for all of the Chiquita Banana commercials. And they were in perfect, perfect condition, the covers and everything. And so I was looking through them and they're, they're pretty funny. You know, they'll put them in the refrigerator, they turn brown and blah, 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 blah. And so uh, we had a lot of fun with that. In fact, Jimmy Kimmel, when my mom was in her 80s, he did this whole segment when Chiquita was having some issues down politically in South America. And so Jimmy Kimmel had her all dressed up as Chiquita. And it was, you know, really great. So it was one of these things that had longevity to her, to her career. And she played with it and had a good time. Okay, Rocky, let's get this legendary story about your father out of the way so that we can start talking about you. All the Hollywood scandal sheets allege that in 1951, your dad was shot in the crotch by film producer Walter Wanger, who believed your father was having an affair with his wife, Joan Bennett. But the truth is that he was shot in the inner thigh. Isn't that right? Well, the first thing that I tell everybody when they ask me is, well, if you, I wouldn't be here if he was shot in the balls. And so, <laughs> uh, so obviously, Wanger missed. Um, and and so. <laughs> And so, yes, but yeah, de definitely dad was having an affair with, uh, with Joan Bennett. But yes, my dad was Joan's agent. He was madly in love with her. He was in a sort of a, a stale marriage. Uh, Joan was in a, in, a, in a bad marriage or a difficult marriage with Walter. Walter was in debt. He, um, they, they were at odds with each other. And Joan was the siren. She was quite a bit older than my father. And they started to have this affair. And the affair actually was happened in Jay Cantor's apartment. And Jay Cantor 
was actually Marlon Brando's first agent. He was a very, he was like just basically out of the mailroom. He was this young agent at MCA. And my dad convinced him to let him use his apartment that was around the corner to, to meet with, with Joan. And that actually was part of the reason that Billy Wilder and Izzy Diamond wrote the Jack Lemon film, The Apartment. It came from the affair that my father had with, with Joan Bennett. Anyway, it was a scandal. Uh, dad was shot. He, he nearly died because he, where the bullet was, um, in his leg, and it uh, unfortunately, you know, his career wasn't really derailed. He, he he had to you know make amends with his wife, who unfortunately died a couple of years later of a heart attack. Walter and Joan's marriage was very difficult at that point. In fact, they separated. Walter was sent to jail for a number of months. Actually, came out of jail and made two wonderful films. Um, I Want to Live, where which Susan Hayworth won the Academy Award, the Barbara Graham story, and he did Riot and Cell Block 11. So prison actually influenced his movie making and some two wonderful prison movies. Joan's career was basically dead, and which is sort of unfair because Wanger went on to continue to make movies and my dad went on with his career. But, you know, a woman in Hollywood at the time who was involved with the fair, I mean, it, it, she was treated pretty unfairly and she never really recovered, which is just quite tragic because she, she was just part of a group of these, of these people who made some bad choices, including my dad. Well, I'm very glad that if he had to get shot, it wasn't in the crotch because I'm really enjoying uh, my friendship with you. I'm enjoying mine with you and your show. Rocky, your book is so entertaining that I laughed out loud all the way through it. One of the most hilarious episodes is the one about Joan Crawford in your father's office when she was all upset about her breakup with lawyer Greg Boutzer. Can you please tell us that story? All right, well, let me back it up a little bit. So Greg Boutzer was a famous attorney in Los Angeles, an entertainment attorney and a very good friend of my father. And my dad and Joan lived around the corner from each other. On, my dad was on Bristol Drive in, in, uh, in Brentwood and Joan was around the corner from that. So they frequently would have dinner. So one night my dad was over there for dinner with Greg and Joan at Joan's house. And, and Joan says, well, you know, uh, you know, I'd love to go and like, you know, watch, show you something in Mildred Pierce. And Greg is like, what could you possibly want to see? You know, she already won the Academy Award by then. You know, we've seen the movie 20 times. What could you possibly want to see? So, so, well, you know, there's just something in real for, you know, I want you to see, it. I want to talk Jennings, come back with us. And my dad was like, I'm out of here. You know, he, he made her deal on Mildred Pierce. So he, he was out of there. He went home. So, so anyway, John convinces Greg to go back into their, their screening room, which was outside in, in a separate house. And he had a big case the next day and she knew this, he had to be up early and be in court. Anyway, they start running the film. And the next thing Greg does is he wakes up you know, early in the morning and he thinks, oh, how sweet she was, she let me sleep. And, and he goes to the door and he can't get out, it's locked. And he's looking at the clock, the phone's cut. And it's like, you know, six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, he's missing court. 10 o'clock, the police show up and arrest him for trespass. And they, they take him out. And the way she had it to this back gate and into the front yard. And when he gets to the, to the front, all his clothes and his suitcases and everything are thrown out there. And Joan's standing in the window. And she's saying, that's the last time you'll fall asleep on a Joan Crawford picture. So... <laughs> So that's, that's, I told you that story to tell you the next story. Back in the 50s where everybody drank a lot, you know, the executives and the agents had bars in their office. And my dad, you know, had a bar in his office. So it was 5 or 5.30 on, a, on, a, on an evening and Joan was in for a meeting and they had the meeting and, uh, and she, she, wants, she goes to the bar to pour herself a drink. My dad, you know, goes back behind his desk and he looks up and he sees her pour some scotch into her hand and then lift up her dress and then put her hand like into her crotch. And then she turns to my dad and she says, you never know who you're going to meet. And she walks out, she walks out. <laughs> and so, you know, these are stories. I mean, the stories are just crazy. And so, you know, I put some of these in the book and I can tell you, there's some stories in this book that no one's heard because, you know, they came from the mouth of my father who experienced them. And, and part of what, you know, I've been doing recently actually is trying to, you know, interview people and who are older and getting these stories because when they pass, the stories go. And I'm fortunate that I with some of my dad's stories, I was able to write them down. Some of them appear in the book. Yes, I think that's a wonderful thing to do because this is part of Hollywood history. And these stories really give you a sense of who these people really were. Uh, and you've given us two stories that really flesh out uh, the um, the image of Joan Crawford 
in her private life that's very entertaining. Well, you know, he, he got along with her. He got along with most of the actresses and that he dealt with. She was tough, but, you know, he, he, I think he liked her. He liked tough, he liked, you know, tough broads, as they would say in those days. Rocky, there are so many experiences you had as a kid that are just surreal, like watching Olivia Newton-John do a nude photo shoot in your parents' pool, or wandering around the Playboy Mansion, or being pals with Steven Spielberg, or shooting pool with Clint Eastwood, or eating peanuts with presidential candidate Jimmy Carter. Did it ever occur to you when you were growing up that one day you'd write a book about all these adventures? No, I don't think so. I mean, first of all, I'm not a sort of kiss and tell kind of guy. And all these people were really good to me for the most part. I think that this whole book came out of left field, as they say, because I was in an office one day and, and, and an executive who I was having a meeting with, she says, you know, tell so-and-so about, you know, the, the shooting episode. And so I tell the shooting episode from my perspective as a 13-year-old in school, which became the story. My mother said, your father was shot in the balls when I came to school. And my best friend came running down saying, hey, Wang, my mother said your father was shot in the balls. And so I went home and I like wrote that story. And I told my kids about it who were old enough to hear the story. And they were, dad, you, you got to write this stuff down. You know, you got, you got to do something with it. And so, you know, I wrote, wrote up this, a bunch of stories about my relationship with my father. And my mom was still alive then. And it was funny because I, she was my, a great editor for me and I'd send everything to her and she would read some of these stories. And she said, I didn't know this happened. <laughs> I didn't know this happened. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, anyway, it's a lot, it was a really fun to do and I'm glad I did it. And my kids now have, have it. And uh, my younger daughter said, dad, I just, I can't, I can't read the book. I can't, I can't picture you having sex with anybody. So I can't read the book. And my older daughter was like, yeah, it's really funny. Erica. You know, just gotta like go with it. You know, it's dad. <laughs> so, so. I do have to say you had quite the amazing sex life as a young guy. Uh, really, um, uh, I think everybody that reads that book is very envious of you. That's for sure. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, if they, they, I, I don't know, or I don't know. I just, from saying that I think maybe because I wrote it down that it appears like that it's much more prolific than some of my friends who are much more active than I was, except I think that some of the stories in how they happen to me make it entertaining as opposed to, uh, just a story of somebody having sex. I mean, there were some, you know, sort of crazy situations that, that came, the forces came to me. So some of those got put, put down there. I have to tell you, I've read a lot of Hollywood memoirs, but none of them were anywhere near as entertaining as yours. For example, as I was reading about the dinner you had at Wimbledon with Martina Navratilova, Renee Richards, Sugar Ray Leonard, Rudolf Nureyev, and Milos Forman, I was wondering, did you ever have to pinch yourself to believe that all of this was really happening to you? I, I, you know, I was aware of it, but remember to your first question, I was used to being around celebrities and movie stars, which also made me sort of, I guess, immune to their celebrity. I just saw them as people. Um, I was much more enamored or in awe of sports figures, I think, than, and then much later in life with political figures than I ever was with Hollywood figures. Because for me, I mean, I hate to say this because I'm still dealing with actors, but the most, most interesting people in Hollywood are the writers to me and the directors more so than the actors. So, but what was fascinating about that evening is that, is that only Martina or someone like Martina could bring that sort of group of people. So dis from so many different worlds together because of Wimbledon. And Martina and I met in, uh, in Denver because I was already directing television, but people knew that I was a, an avid tennis player and a tennis fan. And they asked me to, uh, or Keo asked me to do a Martina Navarrete level workout video. And so it's like the last thing I wanted to do is a, every workout video. I mean, after it was, you know, Jane Fonda had done her. So everybody was doing workout videos but I wanted to meet Martina. And so I did the workout video. Martina and I became friends and she invited me over to, over to uh, Wimbledon. It was a, a once in a lifetime experience. I saw her beat Steffi Graf in the finals. I sat in the player's box. People thought I was dating Martina. The, all the, all the, the, the rags were calling me up. They couldn't figure it out because she'd just come out as gay and who was this guy. And it was, so, you know, we had a lot of fun playing with that. And, uh, you know, it was great. You know, it was a great experience and I'm still in touch with her today. And it was wonderful, it was wonderful. Did you grow up knowing the kids of other celebrities? I, I know you hung around with Jamie Lee Curtis for a while, but were there others? 
Not so many. Um, you know, Gigi Garner was a, was a friend. Jamie, Jamie and Gigi were sort of tangential friends. We would go to the racket club, which was, you know, the, the sort of the where movie stars and movie executives would go to from like probably the 40s and the 50s. And um, it was a tennis club and, 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 and we'd go down there. So they would be down there, you know, and so, you know, we'd see each other there, but, and we're friends, but we weren't uh, super close. And, and most of my friends were not in the, in the movie business. Uh, in fact, in fact, none of my best friends were the sons or daughters of, of movie stars. They were just sons and daughters of, you know, nice, hardworking people. <laughs> well, what no... do you think is the most misunderstood thing about being the child of a Hollywood celebrity? Well, I think that 90210 and all the sort of the, the you know, the history of Hollywood and, and sort of the bad boy behavior that you've seen, you know, with children of, of Hollywood stars, you know, paints the picture of this is what Hollywood is. But for the vast majority of people that I know who are children of Hollywood, they're pretty normal people with exceptions. And the exceptions are the people who you read about in the papers. And, and that's, that's where that goes. But, you know, in the book, you know, going back to the other book, uh, Letters from Hollywood, is, is that I had to interview a lot of the children uh, and grandchildren of the icons. And these are talking, I'm talking about huge icons. My dad was like a big film producer. But when you're talking about the children of Humphrey Bogart and Audrey Hepburn, you know, and David O. Selznick, and you're talking about those kind of iconic, big casting shadow figures, you know, their children are now in their 80s or you know even some of them in their 90s you know they're really normal like live normal lives i mean some you know some of them had to come to terms with their parents celebrity that they could never match that especially if they wanted to follow their parents into it but like you know bela lugosi jr he's a very very important lawyer you know yet his dad was bela lugosi so you know he's you talk to him he's you know his, his conversations about the law it's not really about the movies, but he's, you know, he loves his dad. So he's like me and he talks about his dad like I talk about my dad. But that's, that's, I think, the, the norm as opposed to the exception of uh, bad boy Hollywood. You wrote that Steven Spielberg was like an older brother to you and that he was the coolest dude you ever knew. What made him so cool? Well, through the eyes of a you know 13 or 14 year old, Steven Spielberg was really cool. I mean, he had the first like sort of mobile phone in his car that I had seen, and he had all these cool props from his movies. Now I knew Steven before he was Steven. Remember, I knew him when before Jaws, you know, before he had done a feature film, he was doing television at Universal and he was 10, 12 years older than me. And so he, you know, he'd come over to the house to see my dad and he had this girlfriend, Sue, from Texas, and, you know, we'd shoot pool together, and, and you know, he was just Steven, and, and event, as I got a little older, when I got to be, you know, 16, 15, 16, you know, I got 16, he gave me keys to his house and keys to his car, which he had a prop from Sugarland Express, which was called 2311, and it was the cop car that got bullet holes all in it, so that he had the cop car with all the bullet holes and the blood on the dashboard and the whip antenna, and I had keys to it, and I, like, drove my high school prom in it, and I'd take dates <laughs> out in it, and, you know, I'd just go up to, to his house, and I'd call him and say, you know, I'm going to take 2311. He says, okay, you know, I'll leave the keys under the rock for you, and I'd go up, and I'd take it. In fact, he told me later, that he wanted to give it to me as a graduation gift. My dad says, I don't want that ice store around the house, you know, get rid of it. So it's, it's in a museum someplace now. Yeah, but Stephen was, Stephen was great. I mean, in, in those days, he was, you know, he was very encouraging to me and supportive of me um, in what I wanted to do. And, you know, one of the great sadnesses of my life is that after Jaws, I lost really touch with him. I mean, and, and that sort of like, that was, he was sort of like a brother to me. He sort of, you know, disappeared because his life became so full. And I'm in touch with them from, you know, now and again, but um, that closeness just sort of disappeared at that time. Is it, you know, and I understand intellectually now, but at the time it was difficult for me because we were, were so close. Did your parents approve of you going into the business? Yes, I think they did. I don't think that they encouraged me. I mean, I wanted to be a heart surgeon when I was really young. And, and but at some point what happened is, is that, and I don't know if it was uh, conscious or unconscious, but I read The Most Dangerous Game in sixth grade, the Richard Condon book, which has been made into a number of movies. I don't, I don't have to go into what the story is too much. But anyway, I liked the book and I didn't want to write a book report on it. I wanted to go make a movie, write a screenplay on it. So I asked my teacher if I could write an adaptation of the book, the short story, into a screenplay. And then she said, sure. And I wrote it. And then my friends and I went out and shot it. 
and I got sort of the bug on that. And I started making Super 8 movies all through my childhood and then 16 millimeter films. And then I got my high school had a, a little local television channel and I did 60 shows in high school that ran through, you know, ran on TV, actually. I mean, they were mostly you know, news and sports stuff, but, you know, I did those and, you know, sort of worked in camera rental houses. My dad maybe started at the bottom and, you know, assembling batteries and sweeping floors. And, you know, I just sort of worked my way up and started doing documentaries and series television and features. And, you know, it's a you know, long, long road of little block, little pieces being put together. Well, one of the most important pieces, at least that really impressed me, you were the youngest director admitted to the American Film Institute, and you had considerable success as a filmmaker. One of your most successful films was White Squall, directed by Ridley Scott and starring Jeff Bridges and written by Todd Robinson, who also appeared on our show. My question to you is this. Did people in the industry resent you because they thought you were just benefiting from nepotism? Well, it's a double-edged sword, and there's no question that my father's name and the relationships that I had benefited me. On the other hand, it also mm -hmm. hurt me in a lot of ways. Um, but in terms of White Squall, he had, he, had nothing, he had nothing to do with White Squall. What he did have something to do with me mm -hmm. uh, with is that because of my, who my dad was, he played tennis with Grant Tinker. Mm -hmm. And Grant Tinker was then the head of MTM. And Grant really liked me. And, and I played tennis all the time. He knew I wanted to be a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So I won some awards doing documentaries. And he mm -hmm. you know, made the offer to me. He said, listen, if you let me introduce you to some people over at MTM. And maybe you, know, you can direct one of the episodes there. And so he introduced me to Michael Gleason, who was then the executive producer of, of Remington Steel. And Michael made a deal with me. He says, if you come after in the afternoon from your work, because I was working, you know, doing like film stuff in the morning, like as a producer. And he says, if you can come like pretty much every day and shadow the directors for an entire season, he says, I'll give you an episode. And so I went every day and I shadowed these television directors. And it was weird because in the morning I was like selling, you know, features to movie presidents, movie studio presidents. In the afternoon, I was, you know, with my little clipboard following, you know, directors around and to the end. And so at the end of the first season, I got an episode and then I got another episode. So to your question is, if my dad didn't play tennis with Grant Tinker and I hadn't been my dad's son, I wouldn't have met Grant Tinker, who wouldn't have introduced me to Michael Gleason and give me my job as a director. Now, I still had to direct the film and I still had to prove myself and I did. And so then I got more episodes. So yes, that benefited me in, in, in that way. But my, I don't think my dad ever made a call for me and said, you know, I want to put my kid on this thing. Now, maybe he would have if I wanted to go into like be an agent or be a, in, in the film production thing. But you can't really do that when you're talking about millions of dollars. Hey, you know, my kid wants to be a director, you know, give him $5 million to go make a film. You know, that, that you can't make those kind of phone calls. That has to be sort of, that has to be earned. Um, however, um, the other part of your story is that I have run up, up against people when I have had the job who have given me trouble because their preconception that the only reason I had the job was because I was Jennings Lang's son. And that was always troubling to me because it was, you know, I was working really hard. I was a very serious filmmaker. I did my homework. I, I studied film. You know, I worked as again. I worked in camera rental houses. I swept floors. You know, I understood filmmaking from. I took acting classes to understand actors. I wrote scripts. I did. You know, I learned everything I could possibly be to be the consummate filmmaker. So when I was called on that, like, oh, you're only here because your dad. It was really hurtful. And it was a sensitive spot for me. And, um, and so it, you know, it went both ways. There's no question. Yeah, I can totally understand that. At the age of 22, you made an incredibly interesting documentary about the making of the movie Tootsie, which showed the profound stress in the relationship between Dustin Hoffman and director Sidney Pollack over creative differences. I always knew that Dustin Hoffman was intense, but your film gave me the impression that he really put Sidney Pollack through hell over the way his character should be portrayed. Now, Tootsie was a hugely successful movie that got 10 Academy Award nominations. Did Dustin Hoffman ever admit that it was in fact a great film? I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I do, do need to back this up to give your viewers a little history. Tootsie was a project that Dustin created and it was about 
a man tennis player who dresses up like a woman mm -hmm. because he wants to be a tennis player, which, you know, following the Renee Richards story. And that, so that mm -hmm. script ultimately went through very, various different drafts and it ultimately became Tootsie. And so when it came to Sydney, there had been a number of directors, a number of drafts involved with it, but Sydney only would take the, the, the script if Dustin signed over control to him. So that was a big thing for Dustin to take his baby and si assign that control to Sydney. And so the conflict often came with what was the intention of you know, how the Dorothy Michaels, Michael Dorsey character should play. And you know, Dustin felt that it really what this was about is the desperation of an actor to do anything that he could do in order to get the part and sydney's sort of feeling was that there's a bigger story here was that michael dorsey puts on the dress and becomes a better man for having the experience of being a woman mm -hmm. now there's that subtle except that it came to battle with a lot of a lot of the conversations and a lot of the arguments in the film and how certain scenes were played and what was the intention of character and so, you know, Dustin was, was difficult for sure, but, you know, Sydney, Sydney also could be difficult. And in fact, it, it, the, the movie shut down for a while and Mike Ovitz had to come from CAA and actually negotiate a truce because Sydney was like, you know, at this point, like, I, I don't need this crap. You know, I, you know, let Bob Benton come back in and direct it. He's Benton had just done Kramer versus Kramer. So I'll, I'll get off of it. But, you know, Dustin didn't really want Sydney to get off of it. And so it was really a complex, you know, movies are complex anyway. You become this like nuclear family for short periods of time and everybody's together. And then, you know, things, all this sort of stuff comes, comes up and explodes and, you know, relationships are formed and, you know, affairs happen and all this stuff goes on. So a lot of what happened in Tootsie is sort of like typical, except that it really did rise. And uh, one of the crazy stories, which I was, you know, party to is that is that Dustin and Sydney stopped talking to each other. And the, the day that Dustin was supposed to see a cut of the film, Sydney called me the day before and said, you know, I'm showing the film to Dustin tomorrow. Will you go sit with him and watch it? And I said, okay, sure. You know, uh, Sydney and I become close. I was young. And, and, and so it was Lisa, Lisa, um, and Lisa Hoffman, who is, you know, Dustin's wife and Lee Gottsagen, who was Lisa's uh, brother. So the three of us uh, watched, uh, the three of them and me watched Tootsie and like they didn't laugh the whole movie. And I was like laughing by myself. I was just going, what's the matter with them? And so we go, after the movie's over, we go to the bathroom, Dustin and I are in like, you know, adjoining urinal, urinals and Dustin's just steaming. And he's like, I'm afraid he's going to turn to me and like pee on my shoe, but he's like steaming. And he's like, you know, someday we're going to do a documentary and tell, tell exactly what really happened with this, with this film, because I've done this documentary. We're going to, we're going to talk, we're going to tell what really happened. And so um, we, we walk, it's D Dustin and I are in front. Dustin's like, puffing his head and Lisa and Lee are behind and, and Sidney Pollack's office was on a balcony mm -hmm. uh, above the parking lot at Columbia, which was um, now on the Warner Brothers lot, but the old Columbia was up there and he sat on, he was a balcony in the corner office and he's smoking a cigarette um, and, you know, hanging over the balcony waiting for us to come. Hey, and Dustin starts screaming at him how he screwed up the movie all, all the way across the parking lot. Like doors are open, windows are open, people are looking out. Dustin spewing spits coming out of his mouth. And Sydney's like, Dustin, come on in. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. And they went in. Whatever they happened, they ha happened. As, as Sydney would say, we'll argue about it. He'll tell me what he wants. I'll tell him what he, what I want. And at the end, I'll do it my way. So... But anyway, so that's what Sydney did, and the movie came out and was a massive success. And I think knowing Dustin the way he was, he probably was happy and acknowledged that the movie was successful. But I'm not sure that he would acknowledge that maybe he wasn't right, and maybe it would have been better his way. I don't know what he thinks. I lost track of Dustin completely after the movie was over, whereas Sydney and I stayed close until he died. Am I correct that Sidney Pollack was the most influential person in your career besides your father? That's, I would say that's correct. I mean, Sidney, I, I've told people that. I mean, the reason why is that, you know, coming from my father, being my father's son, and mostly seeing these big action movies, they were plot oriented movies that were, you know, action and venture and, you know, plot thin, I mean, uh, character thin and plot strong. And, you know, Sidney started talking teaching me and I, I was able to start to see about 
the, the layers of acting and how you deal with various actors from who coming from different points of view. If you think about it, you know, Dustin came, came from Method and Neighborhood Playhouse, where Sydney had come from, and Terry Garr came from, from Method. Bill Murray wouldn't even, you know, would <laughs> read the text. He'd make stuff up on the line. Jessica Lange didn't want to talk about anything. So if you got, you know, a Method actor with an actress who doesn't want to you know, talk about the line and wants to be instinctual, you know, as a director, how do you manage that? How do you handle these different, these different stars? And Sydney was masterful in that. So I learned a different side of filmmaking through Sydney and ultimately realized that it was okay for actors to take a breath and not just pop, 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 you know, through which you see a lot, especially in sitcoms. And that it was okay to just like let things sort of unfold themselves. As a writer, which I hadn't been there, as I moved into writing and directing myself, the experiences that I had with Sydney impacted me as a as a filmmaker and still do to, to this day. And so I would say that my my dad and Sydney were the most influential on my career, my dad by far the most. But I don't think I would have the insight or the layers of, of filmmaking that I have without having the experience with Sydney. Your father had a saying about critics that I just love. He said, critics are people who come down from the mountain after the battle is over and shoot the dead. Do you think critics have as much influence today as they used to have, say, 50 years ago? No, I don't. I think, and I think that, I think that, you know, look, critics could close a show in the old days. You know, you got a bad Broadway review and, it, you know, the show died. I mean, you know, it, and the great critics of, Bosney Cross, Cross, I can't pronounce it, Cross, Bosney Cross, whether I guess from the New York Times and Vincent Camby and Pauline Kael, you know, and you're talking about those film critics who are really thoughtful, intellectually oriented. Um, I mean, you read Pauline Kael's uh, um, review of Chinatown. I mean, it in itself, it's an award winning. It's a, it should be a, you know, a Pulitzer. It's, a, it's so well constructed and so thought out. And bon, or, I mean, a Bonnie and Clyde. It just amazing, amazing. And so today, you know, what do you do? You go to Rotten Tomatoes and you look at, you know, all this and all that. I mean, ten, I tend to, when I look at reviews, I almost always look at some of the, just the fan reviews to sort of see what's happening with the fan, fans. I mean, you get a general sense of it. But as I've always said, if you're a normal person and you have like generally normal feelings, you know, normal anger, normal, you know, love and, and the major, if majority of the films that everybody likes, you're going to like, you know, and you can still find those quirky ones out there. But if you're looking for like in the middle, you know, pretty much look at fan reviews. And if you're, you're going to get a pretty good sense of what people like or they don't like. And, you know, that more dictates to me than somebody who's looking to increase their Twitter followers by, you know, how crazy they can be. So Rocky, you've now written eight books, including two children's books. At this stage of your career, has writing become more important than filmmaking? No, I think it's, I, I think it, it has. And I think what it has done is it gives me a safe haven because the movie business is caustic. It's, it's, it beats you down. It's, it's, it's difficult. You lose more than you win. Um, there's no rhyme and reason for the way things are going. I mean, right now we're having this huge backlash to the way that movies have been for so many years. And so for the, you know, the, the, the white older male, it's, you're almost like a, like a felon. You can't, you know, can't get arrested because during towards multi, you know, uh, multiracial and, and, and women, and women. And I get it. There's a, you know, there should be a balance in that. So so the move, so it's very difficult. So the, what the writing does is it allows me to, to not have all that noise out there and I can write for myself and, and enjoy it and do okay with it. But I, you know, I've got seven movie projects now and TV projects out there and, you know, and many of them are with women and many of them are with, with ethnic casts or directors or writers. And, and, and that's never been an issue for me. I mean, I always, I've always, you know, looked at who's the best person for the, for the, for the project, but the Hollywood has reacted so much that it's um, right now, you know, you get calls from people and they say, well, you know, can you change the cast around? Can you change the nomination, the cast around? I mean, or, you know, I'm out there pitching a Leopold and Loeb project to, to, you know, white guys. And they're saying, no, no, can't you, can't you find a project with, with somebody else, you know, more diverse looking group. 
And I'm like, well, yeah, but I'm trying to want to do this because it's death penalty and we're dealing with death penalty, 100th anniversary of the Leopold Loeb case. So, you know, why can't we do this as well? So it's it's a very difficult time. And so the writing is a, is a place to go that's safe for me. And I want to make it very clear. I, I mean, I don't, I think that Hollywood is reactionary in a lot of ways. It has been over, over the history of Hollywood. But, you know, they do need to make amends. They, they do need to fix the problem. It's been a big problem. And, you know, traditionally. And, and so Hollywood really had people pigeonholed. And so, you know, it's a reaction to that. And with Black Lives Matter, and we're seeing with George Floyd, it's a reaction. And, it, you know, and it makes perfect sense. But it's hard for anybody who's been in the business who has built what I've built and, this, and uh, to know that I'm at a disadvantage now, but I get it intellectually because that other group was also a disadvantage for a much longer period than I have been. And so it eventually hopefully will balance out. I think it will. And I think it's encouraging that you have so many projects on the go. And I sure hope you're going to come back on our show and talk about them when you're ready. I will. It's all, it's all fun. And, uh, and I love making movies and I love writing and I thank you for having me on the show. Well, Rocky, you said in your book that fundraisers and funerals are great places to network, but I think interview shows are good places too. And I wanna thank you so much for coming on our show, talk about your life and your wonderful book. I've enjoyed it immensely. Thank you very much for having me. Promise me you will come back every I time you have back. a new project. I will, I'm gonna write the, the Harvey Chronicles. <laughs> our guest has been filmmaker and author Rocky Lang. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.